Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our uh, last um, CPD for the year. Um, tonight's uh, presentation, uh, as, you, as you would have known, is uh, by Dr. Da uh, Professor David Manton. And I'd like to give special thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Gilbert um, Labour, who organised uh, tonight's uh, CPD through his friendship with uh, David Manton. Um, Dr. Labour is one of our uh, supervisors in our clinics. And when he's not uh, supervising in the clinics, he's also our professional uh, wine connoisseur. Um, it's been great having him here at JCU because we've had a number of wine tastings since he's been here, which has made uh, the job much more enjoyable. Um, Professor Manton, um, most of you would have read this, uh, he is uh, currently the uh, Ellison Story Professor of Child Dental Health. He heads the section of Growth and Development, Pediatric Dentistry and Orthodontics at the University of Melbourne. And he's also involved in several collaborative and postgraduate research projects. Uh, tonight, um, Professor Manton will be discussing recent advances in calcium and phosphate technology and the role of developmental defects in dental care. Please welcome Professor Manton. Thank you. And, uh, an hour. Um, uh, coming from private practice background, I always ran to time, and since I became an academic, that's become less important in my life, so I'll keep my watch there. So with, with karyology, we have probably different ideas to what you've been taught. So the first part, I'll run over the concepts that we think are important in karyology, a little bit of research we've done, especially with respect to CPP, ACP. Uh, I'm part of a team that uh, has been researching that for the last, well, I've been doing it for 10 years. Uh, it's been researched for nearly 30 years because it was being researched when I was an undergrad in the early 80s. So it's been around for a while. And then hypermineralized enamel is an area probably in the last four or five years we've taken a greater interest in. Uh, my background, I'm a kid's dentist. And we seem to be seeing more hypermineral enamel than we used to. Whether it's like asthma and we're just better at picking it up, I'm not sure. But maybe because of the caries rate decreasing, it's more obvious. So we've had a number of postgraduate projects looking at hypermineralised enamel, so I'll run through a few things with that and then show you some of the newer research that hasn't been published yet or is in the process of being published, uh, and try and keep it clinically relevant as well. With the karyology, if I'm telling you stuff you already know, just tell me and we'll roll it over. Normally, I mean, my normal waffle, say in Europe or somewhere, we'd do a day on this. So it'd be three hours in the morning on karyology and it's three hours in the morning, only the afternoon on hypermin. So tell me to shut up if I keep waffling. Ah, I should, GC pay for me at this. And I should mention, uh, Steve, I don't know whether you know, a guy called Stephen Haynes who runs GC Australia. The beauty of GC is we have a very close relationship with them because they obviously make the product that uses a lot of CPP, ACP. Uh, but as a lecture sponsor, in, I suppose the hundreds of lectures I've done now that they've helped sponsor, they've never once asked me or told me to talk on anything. So a lot of big companies screw you, basically. They give you the lecture and say, go and do this. So for one thing that GC doesn't do is that, so I should mention that. So the standard start is why are we here? We still see these kids. Uh, this is one from last year that we saw from memory, 14-year-old girl uh, from Waterville down Western Victoria. And she wasn't concerned about her appearance. She came in for pain. And the simple truths about caries is you get it under plaque. And you get it under care, gentle plaque. You're meant to have plaque. Don't spend your life trying to eliminate it because it's meant to be there. It's just not meant to be karyogenic. But it's funny, certainly teaching, or used to teach undergrads, 
you know, they go looking for caries in spots that doesn't get a lot of plaque. And yep. it's, it's quite a simple disease if you think that basically it's where plaque is, you feed the plaque the right stuff, and you'll get caries underneath it. And hypermission. Now we see, still see a lot of people who misdiagnose enamel hypermineralisation. So we still get kids referred that they've got fluorosis. And this is totally distinct. We rarely see fluorosis. And we've been fluoridated since 77, 78 in Melbourne. And fluorosis is such a tiny problem, it's not funny. It's just something that rarely passes my eyes. So you're probably getting hammered at the moment by the anti-fluoridationist because fluoride's so young in Queensland. But uh, certainly for us, fluoride is just a non-issue. Uh, which is something we didn't think would occur. So the main issues we tend to concentrate on caries are trying to understand the social issues around the children. And I'll talk with, an as with the aspect of children because it's what I do clinically. But caries is really a social disease because it's the social context of the child that influences what they do with respect to their oral health. Basically, caries is a dietary-driven disease. If you don't feed the plaque kerogenic substances or substrate, you don't get caries. So if you have a perfect diet with very low levels and low frequency of exposure of fermentable carbohydrates, you won't get caries. But obviously, that's nearly impossible. And I suppose the driver of using this social context of the child is that it's very hard to change behaviour. So you've got to try and understand the child and the parent, the parents, to have any chance of changing behaviour. And standing on a pedestal like this and telling people what to do is nearly pointless. Uh, you might think that the patient's nodding and agreeing, or the mother is, because it's not a mum that comes on the in with our kids. But the evidence to suggest they actually change their behaviour indicate that they don't. So it's a, another day of talking. So we tend to do a bit more motivational interviewing style. So we don't tell them to do things. We provide information, ask if they're understanding, whether it fits in their context of understanding. So it's a complex problem changing behaviour. So don't just see it as plaque, I want to get rid of the plaque because you won't cure caries by that way. You have to change the risk factors in why they're getting the caries. They'll never brush all the plaque away. You won't hexidine the plaque away. Maybe if you rinse with White King, you have a pretty good effect, and then you tend to end up with dead patients, which is never good. Uh, but all the current ways we have of reducing the plaque load won't get rid of caries. You have to look at the other factors. Now, assume, like me, you were told enamel dissolves at 5.5 or 5.6 pH. Nonsense. It dissolves because the solution at the surface becomes desaturated. And in a normal, healthy mouth, that occurs at about 5.5. To do with the amount of calcium and phosphate in the solution at the enamel surface, and the pH moderates how much of that calcium and phosphate is there, that makes it desaturated or supersaturated. So this is a little concept that it's hard to explain. It took me five years to understand it. But uh, as you decrease the pH, you need more calcium and phosphate in solution to maintain saturation. So if you call saturation one, if you're saturated at a level of one at pH seven and you drop to 5.5, it will become desaturated so the enamel will dissolve to try and get back to equilibrium. But if you have a lot of calcium and phosphate at 5.5 in solution and it's saturated, it won't dissolve. And so that's where these newer calcium and phosphate technologies come in. That it's nice if the pH is high, but it doesn't have to be. So I can make you a solution of pH 3 that will remineralise your teeth because it's super saturated with calcium and phosphate. So pH is important, but it's not the real driver. It's the moderator. 
calcium and phosphate saturation is is the most important thing when you think about caries and loss or gain of mineral. So it's a new concept, it's sort of that horrible word, it's a new paradigm. And we're starting to see changes in the international caries community that's starting to understand that, and the commercials are starting to understand it because you're seeing a lot of products coming out with calcium and phosphate. And big commercial companies are very quick at picking up new ideas that they think they can make money from. So does that make sense? So what I tell patients, because I talk about it to patients in a reasonably simple way, when I'm trying to explain to them saturation, because most, most don't have a chemical background, you say, right, if you dissolve, and I normally talk about salt, but if you dissolve calcium and phosphate in a glass of water, you've got as much as you can get in there, that's a saturation of one. And if you add any more, what dissolves will either precipitate out or it just won't dissolve. And so that's the concept that, in my head, when I'm looking at kids and thinking of caries risk, I'm thinking of how much calcium and phosphate do I need to maintain saturation or hopefully get super saturation. So the glass of water in my head, and you'll see it'll pop up a few times, is how I understand it. We make the undergrads do this. Uh, I never remember that stuff. Uh, it's for chemists. My boss is a chemist, so he wrote this slide. That's what I do. It's a simple concept. It's a balance concept. It's, again, it's the tooth is a bucket. There's a hose running in and a hose running out of mineral. If the hose running out is quicker than the hose running in, you get net demineralisation and the opposite, remineralisation. So they're simple concepts, but they're actually true, and patients understand them. So trying to change patient behaviour by making them understand what they're doing, rather than just telling them, brush your teeth, or use this expensive cream, or whatever, tends not to be very effective. So you have to try and get simple concepts that are actually true in their head. Ah, that's right, they're not working. And I assume you've all seen Johnny Featherston's balance a number of papers that he's written now. I think this one's from the Australian Dental Journal of a few years ago. Basically, there are good things and bad things in the oral environment, and obviously you want to try and get the balance towards the good side. The change in the last few years has been you know, with the understanding that it's the calcium and phosphate that's very important. Fluoride's still the gold standard, but if you don't have calcium and phosphate, you can't get remineralisation. And that's why I'm as a very happy person not to treat adults anymore. But grandma or grandpa with no spit, and they're basically drowning in fluoride, and they still keep getting caries, it's because they don't have calcium and phosphate. All you can ever do is stop the process. You can't reverse it without calcium and phosphate. So it's an extremely important part of the equation. Saliva is your inherent supply of calcium and phosphate. So if you don't have it, the you know, pathway of caries is opened up and it will run down that pathway unless you stop the other risk factors. So basically, it's just a net loss of mineral. You can try and memorise the equations and whatever, but if you think of the bucket in and out, that's all it is, that the hose out is winning if you're getting demineralisation. You've got to quantify early, and again, this is another day of, of talking on early caries detection. If you get caries under plaque, you need to clean the plaque off to detect the early caries lesion. Because if they've got caries, the patient won't be doing it because that's why they're getting caries. So it's still with postgrads at an examination asking, have you done a profi? It's still important. You've got to clean the teeth to look at them. You won't pick up early white spot lesions unless you clean and dry the teeth. And I don't know what scoring system you use. We've gone to ICDAS, ICDAS 2 for undergrads, which is a well, seven-stage score from healthy through to dirty big hole at six. But one and two, one is a white spot you can only see if you dry the surface. So it's an initial lesion. And two is a white spot you can see when it's wet. And three is a loss of surface integrity and four shadowing. 
So when the undergrads classify their carious lesions, they use ICDAS. And there are a whole number of classification systems and they're all fighting at the moment over who's the best. Uh, and I don't know who will win. The other thing that's handy to do is quantification. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with a number of systems, QLF being the major one, but it has to be clinically relevant to what the person does when they leave uni. So it has to be simple and it has to be cheap. Uh, I'm unsure whether you use Diagnodent up here. Uh, I have them and they sit in the cupboard because they're nearly as good as useless. Uh, you know, there are probably 10 different systems now. We use photography a lot. Uh, we use photography with the three-tone gel, disclosing gel, take a photo, because if you're getting the light blue, that's where they're getting caries, because that's cariogenic plaque. And then when we bring them back for review, we do it again and compare the photos. And if you get your lighting right, you can actually get really good imagery of white spot lesions just using a clinical camera. So we use that a heap, uh, because it gives us an idea how big the lesion was and what it looked like. Because I don't know if you're like me, I remember the kid's face when they walked in, but I don't remember the white spot and the buckle of the lower C six months down the track. So it's important to have good records and imagery of your lesions. So the standard mantra that we hit is you've got to detect it early. You can't cut the disease away. The sort of metaphor that I've used for a while is it's like, an, as a occasional smoker. It's like getting lung cancer and just slowly lopping lumps out of the lung without telling the person to stop smoking. That's what dentistry's done for 100 years. They've seen a hole and go, then my purpose is to cut that out, to excise the tumour and fill it up with something that'll stop the food getting stuck in there. Whereas you have to deal with the disease, not the outcome of the disease. So it's a, it's a change in thought about, you know, I think without decreasing carries prevalence, we can be allowed to have that change of thought. There's obviously about 10 or 15% of the population who are still disastrously affected by carries. But a lot of the rest aren't. And so early detection and change of risk factors is the way it tends to be going. Remin, same process, put a bit of energy in there and the hose running in is beating the hose running out. And if anyone wants to have copies of these slides on very happy to send them to you. They're great for going to sleep by. Same thing, but the opposite process. The balance has gone towards net gain rather than net loss. And a simple question, I don't know whether anyone's asked themselves, you know, why don't your teeth dissolve in your mouth? A nice little experiment you can do is get some deionized water, create a little window in an extracted tooth with some nail varnish and keep changing the water for a couple of weeks and you'll get a white spot because the water's desaturated and so the tooth will dissolve, even if it's pH 7, the tooth will dissolve until it saturates. So if you keep changing the water, you'll end up getting a white spot. So it's probably another illustration if it's not just pH, it's saturation. And your teeth don't dissolve because of saliva because it is that supply of calcium and phosphate and other protective factors. And it does a whole lot of stuff. You know, there's immune response. There are a couple of mechanisms for buffering, but the buffering's probably a bit oversold. It's very brittle. It's great for short episodes or short challenges. But if you have a long acidic challenge, the buffering gets used up really quickly. So don't rely on it. And we've sort of moved away from a lot of the saliva testing that we're using that three-tone gel now to pick our at-risk, then we look at their spit, and if their spit looks a bit funny, then we test it. Whereas in the past, we used to test everyone's spit, and I think that was probably you know, overcooking the goose a little bit. We'll concentrate mostly on the calcium and phosphate, but the staphrins have some physical characteristics that are very similar to CPP, ACP. They both have phosphorylated serine groups that help stabilise calcium. And so there, there's some mimicking between these two. And in an evolutionary sense, they're both gland-secreted products 
and some of our guys, the proteomics guys, have written work saying that there's probably an evolutionary splitting off of these proteins, and one ended up in salivary glands and one ended up in breast milk, because CPP comes from breast milk. So there's some correlation between the two. Now, fluoride, still the gold standard. Uh, certainly, as someone who's been involved in, in CPP, ACP research, you hear people say, oh, you're selling it as an alternative to fluoride. It's not. It's an adjunct to fluoride. It's a product that will help fluoride work better and a hell of a lot better. But fluoride is still the major tenet of prevention of dental caries. It's simple. It's cheap. If it's in the water, it requires little compliance apart from doing this. So it's still the major arm of prevention. But it is limited by a number of factors, one being the amount of calcium and phosphate in your saliva. So you can supplement that calcium and phosphate as well. So how does it work? It, it makes the mineral in the tooth less soluble. So fluor, fluorapatite or fluorhydroxyapatite is less soluble than hydroxyapatite or carbonated apatite. And most dental enamels are a mix of a number of appetites. It speeds up the reaction. So you'll see I've got a couple of picks that I put in, that it's like the furnace. It increases the heat of the furnace in the reaction. So you actually get transformation from the iron to the crystal much quicker for fluorapatite than you do for hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite will go through a number of different phases. So it'll go through brushite and whitlockite before it gets to hydroxyapatite, whereas fluorapatite goes straight there. So it speeds up the reaction. It's a better balanced crystal, so that's why it's less soluble. And if you're thinking of that glass of water, if it's got fluoride in it, you need less calcium and phosphate to maintain saturation of one because the saturation is relative to fluorapatite, not hydroxyapatite. So I'll explain that. The glass of water will come back. Ah, told you. So if you're at a saturation of one with the calcium and the phosphate in that glass, you add fluoride, it's instantly supersaturated. So you don't need any more calcium and phosphate to make it supersaturated. The fluoride does that for it. And that's the mechanism of fluoride working in the mouth. That if it's in the plaque, the pH can drop more before you get to desaturation. So it's easier to maintain saturation. So it's easier to get to supersaturation. So does that concept... That's why I started with a glass of water. I know it seems a bit dicky at the start, but I said I wouldn't swear. Uh, but in my head, that's how I finally worked out after trying to understand you know, stability constants and all this, I think the simplistic view tends to work better because I'm not a chemist and it all boils down to it. To parents, I talk about it's like building bricks. There's clay and water. And what does the fluoride do? The fluoride is the furnace and it makes it burn better. So it speeds up the process of making bricks. And there is some physical analogy of crystals and bricks. So I'm telling them that you want to try and maintain that fluoride in the mouth for as long as you can during the day and during the night because the process will be speeded up. So again, it's, a, it's another way of trying to get the information to the parent who, for us, will make the change to the child in a kid-centric sort of a world that we live in. So if you add the fluoride to the saturation of one, instantly supersaturated. That's why water fluoridation works at such low concentration because you, it's got frequent exposures during the day. The problem with fluoride is it's cleared from the mouth quite quickly. So it doesn't persist in the plaque for very long. It's leached out. If you have a lot of it, you might get calcium fluoride formed, but you need a reasonably good acid or pH drop to get that calcium fluoride to dissociate. So it's, it's great for really severe acid drops, but if it's just calcium fluoride, it's very insoluble. So it's not a ready source of fluoride. And I think, in my mind, research-wise, this is done by a Swedish orthodontist 
and uh, I'd say it's probably the best orthodontic paper ever published because it was on karyology. <laughs> Comparing in an in situ model. So for all our, or nearly all of our recaldent work or CPP, ACP work, we use an in situ model. We put slabs of human enamel in what's like an orthodontic plant retainer and they wear it for various periods during the day, rinse out with various products and then you measure the mineral in those slabs. What this guy did was put slabs in a mouth, got plaque developed, looked at the depth of lesions that developed over a month. And as a measure of demineralisation, lesion depth is really good. You never use it for a measure of remineralisation because the lesions rarely change in depth because they mineralise normally from the surface down. So when you see research that uses lesion depth as a measure of remineralisation, just toss the paper out. They don't know what they're doing. And if they're showing marked differences, the methodology of making lesions is out of whack as well. But that's just a little bit of academic advice. He had shark enamel in there because it's nearly pure fluorapatite. So he had a cohort, a group with human enamel, a group with shark enamel, and a group with human enamel, and a reasonably low concentration sodium fluoride mouth rinse. And then when he compared after a month, you'll see the lesion depth of 90 is about the depth of the lesions we use. I'm trying to get my mouse going here. But uh, it's not going to do it for me. You see 90 in the bottom column. I said I wouldn't turn around. Plus 41, so a reasonably large standard deviation. Pure fluorapatite, about a third of that. The once a day fluoride mouth rinse, nearly the same as pure fluorapatite. So it shows putting fluoride in the environment at the surface has a profound effect on the amount of demineralisation you'll get. So it's getting it in there constantly that's really important. So our first in a kid who's at medium risk, the first bit of preventive advice we give is use toothpaste twice a day. Make sure that they don't, like my kid,